Greetings and welcome to our virtual conversation, Illiberal Democracy on the Rise, Examining Brazil, Hungary, and India. I'm Joel Rosenthal, President of Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. Carnegie Council is an independent nonprofit institution. Our mission is to identify and to address the ethical issues of today and tomorrow. For over a hundred years, we've been working to empower ethics as a way to discover common values and interests that can lead to a better future. And I wanna thank all of you for taking this time to spend with us this afternoon. It's no secret that the idea of an open pluralistic democracy is under stress. It's being challenged by a new form of democracy that has certain closed nationalistic and autocratic features. What we're calling in this session, illiberal democracy. In a recent article, I referred to this trend as a narrowing of hearts and minds. And I identified a few of the essential characteristics of illiberalism, a retreat from globalism, an embrace of nationalism, the stoking of ethnic claims, and attacks on democratic norms and institutions. And what I'm excited about today is the opportunity to explore this trend with our expert panelists. Each brings deep knowledge of a particular example of a rising illiberalism. And each example is rich with local, specific, historical, cultural, and political context. I hope over the course of our discussion, we can understand the richness and distinct character of each while also discovering patterns and common features that will lead to a deeper understanding of this current moment. Our speaker biographies are available in the invitation to this program as well as on the Carnegie Council website. So in the interest of time, I'm just gonna introduce each panelist by name and institution. Oscar Vilhena Vieira is professor of the Vargas School of Law in Sao Paulo. He is an expert in constitutional law and politics in Brazil. Gabor Halme is professor of law at European University Institute in Italy. And he is an expert on international human rights and the Hungarian political system. And Prerna Singh is professor of political science and international studies at Brown University in the United States. She is an expert on the politics of South and East Asia including nationalism and identity politics in India. Now, before we begin, just a word about our format. After some initial remarks and conversation among the panelists, we will entertain questions from the audience. So all of you who are watching and listening, I encourage you to use the chat function and engage as we go. Uh, the reason we do these programs live is to engage with you, the audience. So please let us hear from you. Now we have 90 minutes um, and we will likely use it all. Um, so uh, we'll pace ourselves accordingly. Um, I've told the panelists that we'd like to keep this conversation as conversational as possible. Um, and we'll try to move through um, a series of questions and then engage uh, with the audience. So just to start things out, um, I wanted to start, I'm gonna start with Oscar um, and I wanted to ask you um, to maybe elaborate a little bit on this term illiberal uh, or illiberalism. It, it can tend to be off-putting, um, but I think in this case, it's a term we want to dig into a little bit. So maybe you could give us your sort of interpretation and in how it applies to Brazil, the country you're studying. Okay, thank you very much for, for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you and I I'm certain that we'll gain a lot of understanding uh, better what happens in other countries that were uh, attacked by waves of, of uh, autocratic uh, populism. Yeah, yeah, Brazil has a misunderstanding with liberalism. Uh, even economic liberals in Brazil uh, never embraced fully uh, political liberalism. And the left, were always suspect of, of liberal ideas. So in some sense, uh, uh, Brazil is an easy target for, for populism. That's the reason why uh, 
we had uh, waves of populism in, in the past. And in this wave, Brazil uh, did not resist enough uh, uh, to populism. What uh, happened in Brazil at this moment is in some sense the confluence of uh, three major illiberal uh, pillars. One is the very conservative evangelical uh, uh, creeds. Uh, the second one is the nationalist militaries, which were always uh, very discontent with uh, liberalism. And third, uh, I would say economic sectors that are based on uh, uh, attacks uh, on uh, the environment, very extractivist economic sectors. So uh, Bolsonaro was uh, opportunist enough to put together these three uh, pillars of illiberal uh, traditions in Brazil and mobilize them to uh, reinforce his, his power. So yes, uh, Brazil is under uh, illiberal attack from at least three, uh, three sides. And uh, for reasons we will be discussing here further, uh, fortunately, the institutions that were uh, in place by the transition to democracy 30 years ago are until this moment uh, putting some uh, resistance uh, to this uh, illiberal attack. But time really counts in favor of, of autocrat populism at this moment. Thank you. Gabor. Yes, uh, hello everyone, uh, and thank you, thank you for having me here, it's my pleasure. Uh, talking about uh, illiberal democracy, which, which was announced by Prime Minister Viktor Orban in a speech in 2014, proudly saying that uh, Hungary, after four years of, of, the, of the Orban government, uh, proudly get rid of, of liberal democracy altogether, uh, enacted a new constitution, an illiberal constitution, as he, he called it. So we still have this, this illiberal democracy, but let me, let me first challenge the, the term of illiberal democracy. If we define uh, liberal democracy as a kind of limits on, on, on the executive, on the government, uh, to enhance freedom, then I, I would say that the opposite of liberal democracy, namely illiberal democracy, uh, which aims at, at uh, an, an almost uh, unlimited uh, executive uh, and not enhancing freedom, uh, in that respect, this illiberalism cannot be democratic. And I do not consider the current Hungarian system as a democratic system either. It's in between uh, a, a full-fledged uh, autocratic system and a liberal democratic system, a kind of hybrid uh, regime. And one more word about populism, which is also, also one of the phenomena of, of the Hungarian uh, current political situation, very much used uh, as a kind of rhetoric by the Hungarian migration crisis after 2015, but also during the, the pandemic. But I have to emphasize that this is not really a populist regime. Uh, again, this is more or less a rhetoric of the regime, which masquerades in it itself. Uh, masquerades the autocratic character of the of the regime, the illiberal character of the regime. Thank you, Berna. Well, thank you so much for having me on this panel. It's a pleasure to be here. And I think uh, a lot of what I say really relates to what Oscar and Gabor is saying. And so I guess I want to begin by putting this in historical perspective to say that 
India in 1947, at the end of uh, centuries of British colonial rule, really took a gamble on liberal democracy. And so India was poor, it was illiterate, it had low levels of industrialization and very high levels of ethnic diversity. And so the institution of democratic institutions in India at the time of its foundation and the enactment of a highly secular inclusive constitution in some ways uh, flies in the face of most dominant political science theories that would have predicted a less democratic outcome for India. And historically, uh, it, with the brief exception of uh, in the 1970s, a couple of years, India has maintained democratic institutions. And so this present moment in some ways marks a reversal of decades of quite healthy, always flawed uh, democratic institutions in India. And I think this relates uh, to Gabor's uh, description of Hungary in, is that at the present moment, India is somewhere in this kind of space of hybrid regimes. Uh, so just a few weeks ago, Freedom House demoted India from being a democracy to being a partly free democracy. And this gets to the question of what does it mean to be a partly free democracy? And the VDEM Institute in Sweden went one step further and termed it an electoral autocracy. And so we are in this gray zone. Um, I think the key thing is that this is both, um, and I think as Oscar mentioned, it's, and this is why I think we're all on a panel together, is that this is a playbook in some ways. There's an undermining of, const of the constitution. And in particular, just at the, at the beginning, I just want to point out two domains in which this illiberalism, this backsliding of democracy has manifested. And the first is uh, the crackdown on civil liberties, a crackdown on dissent of any sort that is epitomized by attacks on uh, free speech and the media and social media. And the second is this discrimination and hostility towards religious minorities, particularly Muslims, that aligns with this idea of, um, of Hindu nationalism. And so um, I think that in some ways uh, we are in this very dark gray hybrid regime space and it marks a reversal of India's uh, founding ideals and its constitution. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I want to pick up right where you left off, Bernard, and go like one step deeper into this sort of dark or gray hybrid regime. And you, I think you use the phrase, you know, elected autocracy, right? So what I'm trying to do, I'd like for each of you to say just a little bit more about what's going on. Um, again, we still have elections um, and we've all seen the interviews of the people who are voting or autocracy, right, um, um, proudly. So this is the puzzle I am trying to figure out. And I'm also trying to, to figure out, as Gabor said, I'm trying to figure out whether we can use the term illiberal democracy, if this is helpful or if it's, it's a, a obscuring something. Uh, so if you could comment on, on those comments, um, maybe we'll just go, uh, maybe reverse and maybe go from Perna and then back around, so. Um, so thank you, Joel. Yeah. Yes, so uh, electoral autocracy is the term, is now the official classification for India according to the VDEM Institute, which is one of these democracy watchdogs uh, of the sort that Freedom House is. I think the two things that I want to mention, you're right, in some ways it's a paradox because there are elections, um, you know, we can debate about how free and fair, uh, but on the other hand, uh, we are electing these leaders that we might variously call as right-leaning, as populist, uh, as as exclusionary nationalist. And so I think this kind of opens up, I think, this puzzle. The one thing that I'll say, uh, just for the Indian context, uh, just to again put it in historical perspective, is that in some ways, the rise of this present regime also reflects a almost near collapse of the political opposition. And so I think I, I would be curious to hear what Gabor and Oscar have to say, but in India, uh, the BJP for the first time in many years has complete control over both houses of parliament. And this has given it a kind of um, you know, muscle that has allowed it to do and enact certain things constitutionally, like, you know, through elected institutions in a way that uh, 
a much more robust uh, political opposition had prevented in the past. And so in some ways, I think that as we try to understand the rise of these illiberal, right-leaning, populist, excludatory nationalist regimes, we also have to pay attention to what is the flip side of that, which is where is the alternative, what is the opposition, and the rise of these regimes to some extent also reflects a complete crisis uh, of the opposition parties. I'm not. This is not at all to say that there isn't opposition to them, but for me, the the kind of source of that opposition in the Indian context is much richer from civil society uh, and from and not so much in a way from alternate political parties. Uh, and I'm happy to talk more about that, but I thought I would just leave it at that is that before the pandemic broke out, India's streets were, fill, were full of people, you know, pe pe ordinary citizens, organizations on the streets protesting the Citizenship Amendment Act. But those protests were really um, rooted in and led by civil society. Um, the political opposition that is missing, I think is in some ways, uh, I think important to keep in mind as we try to understand the rise of these electoral autocracies or whatever we decide to term them. Gabor? Uh, yes, uh, Hungary preceded India in the category of uh, electoral autocracy put by Freedom House uh, a year earlier. Uh, so actually uh, the free and fair election happened only in the very first uh, 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 election in 2010. Uh, even though it was a free and fair election, it was a very disproportionate election. So the, the governing party, Fidesz, got 53% of the votes. And with that uh, two third majority of the seat, a two third uh, constitution making uh, majority with uh, a majority of the votes. Uh, this used Fidesz to, to uh, enact a new uh, consent by opposition parties, civil society organizations, or the broader public. There was no referendum on that new, new uh, Fidesz constitution. Uh, the two next election in 2014 and 18 were not even fair elections. So in between Fidesz with its two third majority changed the electoral system uh, substantively, making it even more proportionate, meaning that in 2014, they got the same two third majority with for the minority of the votes, they got the two third majority. Uh, and even I should should mention to to characterize this kind of electoral uh, uh, type of autocracy that the elections are certainly not fair in the sense that there is no free media uh, in Hungary. One of the first first issue, issues uh, the Orban government went into was to change the media law and right. making all the public media uh, include the government or government friendly oligarchs. A free media, how can we assess even the 45% uh, of the votes uh, uh, given to Fidesz? Yeah. Thank, thank you, Gabor. Over to Oscar. Um, Oscar, you're still on mute. Perhaps it's just a matter of time. Brazil elected Bolsonaro only two years ago. So we didn't fail in the same category yet, according to Freedom House. Uh, however, uh, we are uh, profoundly concerned uh, of how uh, things are moving in Brazil. If we will go in the same direction as Hungary or, or Turkey or India, or if we will have the same destiny as United States or Italy, where uh, democracy and the institutions uh, saved 
uh, uh, the country from, from populist attack. So this is the, the major question here. But I would also uh, move back a little bit as uh, Prima uh, 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 did when she talked about India. Uh, my professors, uh, like Pilar Moldonio, uh, invested a lot of time to try to understand when uh, the, the authoritarian regime ended and when democracy started in, in Brazil 35 years ago. Uh, and now our generation is starting to, is trying to understand when democracy ends and authoritarian uh, starts. So uh, my perception is that we had a long history of incomplete democracy. So profound and persistent inequalities, different than India, but we do have a, 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 this persistence that make it very difficult for people to uh, benefit themselves from uh, democracy and, 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 and rights. Uh, so Brazil always had this authoritarian, uh, social enrooted feeling and people were treated very distinctly uh, by the state. So yes, Brazil moved to democracy but very incompletely. And now we are regressing to authoritarianism in a, in a faster way. So this is a, a little bit how I, I do think that even though we do not fail to uh, illiberal uh, uh, or undemocratic uh, system yet, uh, the, the, the weight of authoritarian and illiberalism became very uh, heavy in the Brazilian life at this moment. Great, thank you. So uh, this is very helpful, but we also see in this conversation, you know, a certain attraction to this elected authoritarian, you know, hybrid model, right? So, and I take Gabor's point, which is we have to make some, you know, have to have some skepticism of the sort of freedom or fairness of these elections based on the information that's being provided to the electorate and the sort of um, deliberate um, undermining or corrosion of the of the free press and the you know the right of free speech and so on so um, with that noted and we can come back to this this sort of erosion um, of, of free press free speech um, I wanted to go a little bit deeper though into again this what what might be the attractive if I may use that word quality that people are some people are moving in this direction and raise the issue of the, the ethno-nationalist agenda here, right? This is, again, thinking about what's in common of this rise of a liberalism. Let's face it, this is, these are ethnic claims, right? There's, a, there's something there. So um, you know, maybe if you could each elaborate a little bit of how it looks from where you are, whether it's Hindu nationalism and so on, um, the Hungarian nationalism um, in Brazil. I'm curious how this bounced. So maybe, Oscar, I'll start with you. We'll go back around. Um, the, this sort of ethno-nationalist component and how important you see that as a sort of driver of what, of what we're seeing right now. Oscar, start, start. yeah. Starting with me. Yes, yeah. I think the, the nationalist uh, old card uh, that help populist uh, leaders to establish common enemies is, is, is something that we, we understand. Yes, Bolsonaro comes from the military, which are uh, those who, who breed nationalism in Brazil. He's a former military. He played the card of nationalism against uh, mostly uh, what he calls a globalism which is a mix uh, of, of strange ideas, but basically that claims that Brazil lost its sovereignty for those who have liberal ideas in terms of human rights. So he has a strong discourse against uh, uh, human rights and the environmental uh, in, in the, uh, the idea that Brazil is always under threat of the environmental movement that wants to retract from Brazil uh, the sovereignty over the, the force. So the nationalist key here is not against immigration because we don't have any particular wave of Im immigrations arriving in Brazil, but the, the nationalist uh, uh, key is play against the environmentalist concerns of the globe regarding the Amazon. 
and that's how he mobilized Brazilian society against uh, international perception and criticism on, on, on environmentalism. So this is how it, it, it is real. And also there is an anti-communist, which is very awkward uh, 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 discourse made by the military that uh, Bolsonaro incorporated. So who are the communists? Communists are everyone that is uh, not anti-communist. So uh, the economist is, is, uh, that just made a, a nice report on a bet, uh, nice in, in, in terms of qu quality of the report about Brazil, is uh, 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 blamed as a communist uh, 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 journal. So this is the perception, how we play the national uh, list uh, role here. Great, thank you. Um, Gabor, nationalism. Yes, so yeah. uh, before, before, oh. Gabor, can uh, I yeah. cannot see you. Can you hear me? We can, we can see you and hear you. Okay. I. Cannot yeah. see you, but anyhow, uh, let let me let me go back a little bit before sure. I go to to your your uh, immediate question about nationalism. Go back into the recent history of of Hungary, namely what what moved uh, people into the hands of of this autocratic populist like like Viktor Orban. So you have to understand the the very recent history of the democratic transition from uh, 1989 1990 uh, when one of the one of the the main issues of the transition was to to live better than than in the communist times uh, certainly this was the main motivation of the people to change the system beyond uh, the pursuit of, of democracy uh, and freedom. And what was a disappointment after, after about 20, 25 years of, of democratic uh, transition was that, that this living better uh, approach still did not uh, work. Uh, uh, income inequality was still very high and people just wanted to get rid of this kind of neoliberal uh, economic policy of the dead time government, uh, the previous uh, socialist liberal uh, governments. So this made uh, a, a call uh, of, of the populist Orban government uh, for more, for more, uh, 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 new uh, economic policy, uh, very attractive. But I have to say that in the last years, e economic in inequality uh, raised, uh, had, has been raised even more than, than before. And somehow to, to hide this, this fact of, of inequality, uh, the Orban government very much uses a nationalist idea and a nationalist approach. You have to know that the Hungarian uh, uh, population is a very homogeneous population uh, with, without really migrants or, or foreigners uh, in, in the country. So that is why this kind of nationalist anti-migration agenda was very attractive and ever since is very attractive, even though we do not have any migrants in the, in the country whatsoever. Hmm. Amazing. Fair enough. 
to the nationalist question. Yeah, yeah so this is, I mean, actually really directly related to Kabbalah. It's interesting, right? Hungary is this relatively white Christian homogeneous country. India is, of course, exactly the opposite. Um, on almost all indicators, it's one of the most ethnically diverse countries in the world. And so I think the question becomes, you know, it's interesting that you see uh, the rise of the same beast, which is an exclusionary nationalism in which the nation begins to stand in for the dominant ethnic group, whether that's white Christians in Hungary, or, you know, in Hindus in, in India. And you see that, you know, this is happening under very, very different demographic conditions. Um, and so the one thing that I wanted to relate is it was very interesting for me to hear um, Oscar describing the nature of the nationalism and the ethno-nationalism in Brazil. And so, you know, to me, the climate politics of the Amazon, the anti-communism, that's really interesting because in some ways, uh, while I would say that all three regimes are characterized by this right-leaning exclusionary nationalism populism, the one difference is that I would say that those two domains are not the relevant ones in India. So in India, it's very much this idea that the ethno-nationalism that we talk about is really religious nationalism. It's Hindu nationalism. And so to me, the kind of perhaps, you know, a country that we're not explicitly talking about, but which is obviously framing our discussion is to me, it's perhaps most analogous to, to white supremacy um, in the US. And I think just, you know, just as white supremacy and Trump need to be put into historic perspective, the one thing that I will say is that the BJP in a way represents uh, the high tide of a strand of exclusionary Hindu nationalism that has existed since the very time of the foundation of India. So I began my comments by saying that, you know, India was established as this puzzle. It's always called the puzzle of Indian democracy under these very hostile uh, conditions that are not seen as fertile to the institution of democratic, to the institution of democracy. And yet at its very founding, it also faced this really important uh, ethno-nationalist strand. So remember, India was partitioned uh, by the departing British on religious lines. Pakistan was created explicitly as a state for Muslims. And so India had to resist that default categorization, which it did by enacting this highly inclusive constitution of being a country for the Hindus. And so Nehru and Gandhi and a lot of the founding fathers went to great extents uh, to talk about how India was not just a country of Hindus, and it had this constitutional um, and ideological commitment to the diversity that exists today. And to me, you know, Oscar's point about how uh, Bolsonaro comes from the military, to me, the India-Pakistan contrast uh, is also very interesting because, you know, similar histories, and yet Pakistan in some ways follows the trajectory of Brazil a little bit more in terms of its oscillation from mi in military coups and, you know, the, the importance of the military that in Indian democracy, India has managed to keep the military in its barracks. It has not yet had a military coup of the same kind, but the, the nature of the ethno-nationalism really has its roots in what killed Gandhi. So Gandhi was assassinated shortly after India's independence. He was assassinated by someone called Nathuram Godse, who was a member of the same organization that really underpins the power and success of the BJP, the, the party, Janta Party of which uh, Modi, is the leader and you know is the representative and so in some ways this is one particular kind of ethno nationalism which is a religiously exclusionary nationalism that that basically places muslims either beyond or at least in a second class place relative to hindus but it's in a way the bjp's rise is unprecedented in terms of this high tide of nationalism but the ideology and the organization is not that was great. And I'm actually going to go a little bit quicker to an area that I was going to wait till the end, but your setup is just perfect. So, um, and it, it's of real concern, which is, you know, um, this, this ethnic nationalism at a certain pitch, um, which is, you know, could suggest violence um, and could suggest some um, involvement of military, right? So one of the pillars of a liberal democratic society 
is a professional military that's under some kind of you know, supervision and guidance from the elected government with some degree of accountability. Um, I, I'd like to go around the panel and to get to take the temperature of, uh, you know, where do you think we are? Um, I'll speak as the American on this panel, um, one American on this panel, you know, we, we saw something, you know, quite frightening on January 6th. And I think many Americans are trying to figure out, um, you know, what that means. Um, will we see more political violence? Was it the beginning of something or was it a fever that maybe may be breaking? So this is, I'm really into opinions now, but I'm very interested in, in the opinions of all of you in terms of uh, the country you study. And also if you wanted to make a, a, a comment um, generally on other countries, I'd be interested as well. So maybe Perna will start with you and go back around. Actually, Gab, uh, I think Oscar had his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Oscar, please jump in, jump in. I, I, was, I was just, uh, 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 something that Perna uh, said that I think is very interesting, yeah. uh, which is the idea that since Brazil does not have a real foreign threat, besides this abstract notion of environmentalists and human rights people that would uh, uh, dissolve Brazilian sovereignty, uh, really the nationalist ideology in Brazil was uh, built around the internal enemies. So the question is, who are the internal enemies? And the internal enemies, the first ones obviously are the, 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 uh, uh, the communists. But since the communists are also a very abstract notion <laughs> these days in Brazil, all of those who are linked with any notion of culture, science, uh, openness, open society ideologies are viewed as communists. That is the paradox that uh, those who really protect the ideas of liberal democracy are target as if they were the enemies of the national, of the nation, and they are communists. So this is a little bit the paradox. That's just to, to react to what uh, Permna was saying in the case of India. Uh, well, regarding the military, I will Go move on to the, the your question about the military. Uh, uh, well, Brazil has a, a strong uh, military since uh, 1891. They were the founders of the republic. They did the coup against uh, the emperor in the end of 19th century, and they felt themselves always as uh, the moderating uh, uh, powers of the Brazilian uh, republic. They had around nine interventions since. 1891 to 1965, when 64, when they seized power. So they are a strong force, as in Turkey, perhaps, as in India, perhaps, uh, in the Brazilian politics. In the last 30 years, they were uh, 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 removed from the political center. Uh, they were professionalized. Probably the Air Force and the Marines uh, were more professionalized than the, the Army. Uh, itself, and they became very vocal with the crisis, the political crisis that started in 2013 in Brazil with the corruption scandals that involved the left in Brazil. They start to become employed in several security, uh, internal security activities. So that's when uh, Bolsonaro was elected. Uh, this coincides with the return of the military to power. Uh, just to close this session, uh, the dangerous here is that uh, Bolsonaro has a link, an ideological and political link with the low ranks military, which could bring destabilization to the system. Generals, uh, coronels are much more skeptical about Bolsonaro. And he also has uh, political connections with the polices, Brazil has 27 states, 27 different polices that are militarized. And Bolsonaro comes from, and his sons, uh, comes from this uh, uh, environment. So yes, I think that the, the, the largest risk to Brazilian political democracy at this moment is the involvement and the support of the military, especially the military polices uh, 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 on Bolsonaro. This is where this destabilization of the regime could come. 
Thank you. Um, let me go over to Gabor. And how, how do you feel about this issue of uh, public security potential for, for violence, the use of force? Yeah, again, before going to this yeah. question, let sure. me react to, sure. to both uh, previous uh, issues, namely uh, re the role of religion in Hungary and the, the enemies. So I, sure. I did not mention uh, uh, religious uh, uh, diversity because Hungary is a religiously uh, homogeneous uh, society as well, and by the way, a very, very uh, uh, unreligious society. So, uh, true believers, uh, uh, churchgoers are are very low in in percentage in in Hungary. So that is why this kind of of rhetoric of Viktor Orban, uh, after announcing the illiberal democracy, changing it to Christian democracy, uh, which is more more probably uh, uh, well received in Western Europe is, is rather a kind of rhetoric. Uh, besides some anti-Semitic uh, 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 overtones of, of this illiberal uh, uh, rhetoric against George Soros uh, uh, is, is present, but, but it's not a, a real religious uh, uh, issue in Hungary. Enemies are, are there, of course, in that sense, populism works. Uh, the enemies are less the communists who more or less disappeared in the last three decades, but uh, the main enemies are liberals uh, who are very often made equal to, to communists, former communists. Uh, the military, uh, it hasn't played any crucial role since the democratic transition, uh, really. And this is also due to the fact that Hungary very early joined the NATO, very early joined the, the European Union. So it's very hard to imagine any kind of, of involvement of the military in a in a NATO and EU member state. Uh, on the other hand, there are certain, certain issues uh, regarding migration and, and the hatred towards migrants, which is very much used by the, by the, by the Orban government to, to make the security uh, an, an issue, not in a, in a sense of the military, but being alerted, using the secret police against those, those possible migrants uh, who are again, are not present uh, in nowadays uh, Hungary. So this kind of, of, of issue with, with security is present, but I, I do not expect any kind of, of, of uh, violence. Uh, even if it comes to the question whether Viktor Orban can keep uh, its power. Gabor, while you have the, the floor, I just wanted to, to follow up a little bit on the issue of uh, religion. I see there's a comment in the chat from our senior fellow, Janos Pastors, about uh, asking mm -hmm. about the um, you know, minority populations, um, particularly Roma um, in Hungary. And uh, you mentioned very briefly the issue of anti-Semitism. Maybe if you could just say a little bit, just a word or two more about, uh, you know, threats to the minorities in Hungary from, a, you know, a security perspective, you know, physical security and their just the prospects of life uh, in this sort of hybrid regime. So even though, as I mentioned, uh, Religion is not, not the main issue uh, in the agenda of the, of the Orban government, but still one of the first laws they, they enacted back in 2011 when the new constitution uh, has been uh, enacted was a new church law uh, uh, actually deregistering uh, more than 300 very small churches. 
they were not, not uh, big in numbers. I mean, uh, those members of those churches, but the message was to, to make the, the, the Christian and especially the Catholic church the, the main player uh, uh, in the Hungarian religious uh, uh, side. Interestingly enough, the, 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 uh, the Jewish uh, uh, community is, is very well protected in, in the, the, the rhetoric of the Hungarian government. On the other hand, as I mentioned, uh, the kind of hidden anti-Semitism against liberals, against uh, George Soros uh, and, and other enemies uh, of mostly intellectuals of the current government is, is very much uh, uh, present. The Roma issue is, is a different issue. It's, it's unfortunately, it's not, not the Orban government, the first which cannot solve the, the issue of, of about uh, uh, one tenth of the population, the Roma population. Uh, uh, it was always a very, very uh, uh, non-popular issue. And unfortunately, the liberal socialist governments did not dare to solve this unpopular uh, issue with the Roma population. And the, the Orban government is openly anti-Roma. So uh, they provide certain kind of, of, of uh, work-based uh, 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 solutions for the for the Roma, uh, a kind of ne neo or new Darwinist approach to providing very very low uh, uh, employment for very low paid uh, 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 jobs for Roma, which makes them maybe maybe. Uh, uh, supporters of the, of, the, of the government, even though the situation of the Roma in Hungary is, is really uh, a dire situation. But again, they are the, 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 uh, one, one, the, the, the bottom uh, percentage of the population, the current government did not care about whatsoever. Thank you. Fair enough. It's a, there's a lot there on the table. Yeah, so I'll respond yeah. to a few things. I think the one thing that I wanted to mention that in my understanding is perhaps common to Brazil and Hungary and India is that opposition to the regime, to its ideology, to its agenda, becomes a betrayal of the nation. And so, you know, when you criticize the regime, its actions, its policies, you basically become a traitor in India to the Indian to the Indian nation, such that there becomes this really troubling um, equation of an opposition to a political party and its agenda, and basically sedition. And in India, for instance, uh, as part of this crackdown on free speech and uh, social media and the press, there are hundreds of journalists. I mean, India was termed one of the dangerous places, in, uh, one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a journalist because of the killings of journalists, including in you know broad daylight, the gunning down of a really prominent uh, vernacular journalist, Gauri Lankesh. But you see that the nature of the charges that are often slapped against intellectual civil society organizations are sedition charges. And so to me, I mean, of course, this this kind of you know both speaks to how how seriously the the regime opposes any dissent but this equation of dissenting with a party and being a traitor to your country is i think what is the really um, to me deeply troubling aspect uh, of the kind of nationalism that we see ascendant uh, in india and across these countries because you know, the irony in all this is that Indian nationalism was forged in the fierceness of nonviolent protest against the British. And so it's a nationalism that was premised uh, on secularism, on inclusiveness, on an equal place for religious minorities. It was also a nationalism that was based in resistance. And yet the nationalism that, that is 
ascendant today is a kind of abrogates both of these. It's both against dissent and it really comes down uh, against minorities. And I thought that uh, Oscar's point about these insider enemies uh, was a really interesting point. I mean, you can call them insider outsiders. And at some point in time, they do become insider enemies. And so again, this goes to the point that for Hindu nationalism, there's an external enemy and that's Pakistan, which really represents, you know, in some ways, and, and there's an equation again of, of Indian Muslims who are Indian, they are born and brought up in India, but there becomes an equation of the, the, the insider minority uh, and the outsider enemy. And so I would say that in some ways, India has some similarities. So, you know, it's, there's, I don't think there's quite the concern of the military intervening in the way that it has in neighboring Pakistan to overthrow democracy. But what we see is a little bit more nuanced. It's the use of a military threat. And so now, you know, it's well known that the regime kind of used this entire instance. So Pakistan is the bogeyman, you know, so the kind of threat from a neighboring Islamic country uh, and the equation of that to then a kind of, you know, fifth column within the nation itself represented by the Muslims uh, is the kind, so, you know, it's a nationalism that kind of preys on this kind of military threat while still the military is in its barracks. So I think that that is an interesting, uh, in a way, nuance, uh, you know, not quite the kind of violence that we have seen, uh, for instance, in the US. But on the other hand, the scapegoating of Muslims has taken on highly violent, hostile dimensions. And so, you know, the the idea of lynchings, again, bringing it to the US, but we've seen the lynchings of Muslim men. I mean, and this is not just Muslims, you know, India has a long history of, uh, of discrimination and hostility to lower castes. And I think it, a very India specific question, Joel, getting to your opening remarks about the fact that we want to kind of have this comparative, but really get into the textured history of particular cases. So what is the role of Dalits, the former untouchables in Hindu nationalism, I think becomes an important, and women, you know, the highly gendered nation. Um, so, you know, there it's interesting because I there was a, an opinion piece recently uh, by someone I respect who spoke about how uh, Modi tries to come across as a lot softer than, and the explicit comparison was Bolsonaro and Orban. And so, you know, in some ways uh, there is this kind of, you know, there's a similarity across them, but it's also a highly gendered idea of the nation. It's a highly high caste idea of a Hindu nation. So within religious nationalism, there are all these other gender and ethnic identities um, that play into it. And the final thing that I will say again is, you know, just before, because I saw some remarks in the, we're in the midst of a pandemic. And so to me, it's been interesting to reflect in a way of uh, what the pre-existing rise of this kind of exclusionary nationalist, illiberal um, regimes, how that has played into COVID, to responses to COVID and how COVID itself might have been a kind of justification for the for the increasing power of these regimes, but also just to say that, you know, COVID was very convenient uh, for the Indian regime because it was facing one of its uh, strongest oppositions from civil society and ordinary citizens who had come in <coughs> And so the crackdown uh, after COVID was just very, very convenient uh, for the Indian regime, for the BJP regime to kind of, you know, just institute a crackdown. And so in Delhi, which is the city that I'm from, had witnessed this really rich protest by these Muslim grandmothers and women. And so these women were just, you know, completely the entire protest, which had been really inspiring for many people who contested this idea of illiberal nationalism, where, you know, so COVID in some senses just allowed the regime to kind of, in a way, just, you know, come down on these protests that, to me, you know, we are, we're always kind of looking at these dark and gray sides, but there is a lot of opposition, even if it doesn't manifest always in the electoral results. And I think that's a kind of open, open question as well as what would opposition to these regimes look like in these different domains? Wow, that was, <laughs> thank you, Pernas, so much in there. Let me, let me, give back to you maybe three different points just to continue the conversation. Then I want to get to some issues that are in the chat. So one of the commonalities, and thank you for raising this issue of, um, I'll use the word language, 
at the language of the leaders, Bolsonaro, I'll certainly, certainly Trump, Orban in his own way. I don't know as much about Modi, but the way in which they talk about, as you say, the other, the way they talk about their enemies, the way they talk about migrants, um, you know, really taking it to a very low place. Um, and, and not just sort of um, in passing or by mistake, but, but certainly with intention. And I'd like for, for you each to, to talk a little bit about that, just the, 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 the discourse that we find ourselves in now. And I was speaking as an American, but was quite alarmed by some of the language that President Trump would use and not only use, but use to some applause, right? So um, I think that that's a, a commonality that we see in the so-called uh, playbook. There's one other thing I'll just throw out there if anybody wants to, to talk about it. But again, you, you can't help but see it as, as, a, as a pattern, but just blatant corruption. Um, and, you know, almost, almost proudly rewarding one's friends and punishing one's enemies using the power of government in ways that are sort of quite, quite shocking. I don't know if any of you want to, to, to say a word about that. And then lastly, I know I'm going, I'm, I'm touching a lot of bases here, but I, I would like for each of you to say maybe a little bit too about the, about the COVID response. Um, one of the, the puzzles in the United States for me was, um, the, uh, was the, the, the path that President Trump decided to take, which is he could have used it in a way to consolidate, to centralize power. Um, in, in quite dramatic ways, and yet he went the other way. He took the anti-science, anti-elite, uh, you know, uh, libertarian populist road. I mean, it was a, it was a certain logic to that, I suppose. Um, but um, there could have been another path where he could have grabbed power and, and sort of tried to centralize it in some way and federalize it to, to in a sort of autocratic way. So anyway, I'm just kind of curious how that all how that works out in the countries that that, that that you're studying. So maybe I'll just start with Oscar. You can pick and choose whatever I just teed up there for you. Wow, it's it's a long list. Yeah, Let me start. I, I I love the way uh, Bernard uh, put it uh, on the distinction between, and I think we should focus on this: the distinction between uh, inclusive and exclusionary uh, populism which is very important. Latin America has a long tradition of inclusive populism. Take Vargas, take Perón, take uh, uh, or others in, in, in the continent that are seen as the fathers of the, 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 the country. They create labor law, they included people. So there is a difference between the less or the traditional uh, populists and this new wave of populism that are excluded they uh, uh, create their identity by excluding others. And Bolsonaro has been a lower uh, uh, member of the, the parliament in Brazil for 30 years with the, the strongest excluded discourse we ever had, but nobody paid attention to him. But he was against the gays, the, he was uh, inferiorizing women, he was against uh, uh, Afro-descendants, he was against everything. So basically, this uh, discourse of exclusion uh, was present in, in the last 30 uh, years in his, in, his, in his mouth. The interesting aspect is how this excluded uh, discourse attracts people. And, and, uh, I, and my perception is that basically uh, it's uh, uh, close to what happened in the US in the sense of the resentment of the middle class. And when I say middle class in Brazil, I'm talking about poor people that do their living. But the perception that the, the fulfillment of the, the, the promises of constitutional democracy didn't uh, 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 involve them. So they understood that the excluded were receiving benefits from the left and they were left out. So that's why uh, 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 Bolsonaro's discourse was so attractive for, for so many people. So this is, uh, is, is one point. Just to touch on the religion that was not in your list, but was in the previous discussion, the interesting aspect uh, uh, is that the evangelicals match Bolsonaro's uh, ambition to have a national religion. 
and, and Catholicism is all, has always been seen as a globalized uh, religion and a globalized religion that has power to constrain authoritarianism in, in this country. So the Brazilian church was always on the left. It's very alike for those who don't know uh, to uh, Francisco's, the Pope Francisco's discourse. So in, in, in this aspect, uh, the church has been also uh, um, uh, demonized uh, by the Brazilian nationalists because they want to have a national church that is uh, more in, in alliance with the government. Last thing on the COVID, it's interesting because Bolsonaro plays the anti-science, anti-rationality, anti-everything uh, uh, in terms of the COVID. However, uh, uh, the state governors assumed the responsibility to implement uh, more rational standards in complying with the challenges of COVID. And the Supreme Court play an extremely important role in protecting the autonomy of the states to, to implement their own policies. So in Brazil, federalism became a powerful tool to contain Bolsonaro during the pandemic. And now the Supreme Court also granted the minority in Senate uh, the opening of an uh, inquiry, uh, uh, investigation on Bolsonaro's conduct uh, during the pandemic. So Senate and the states are uh, checking on Bolsonaro's uh, uh, absolute irresponsible uh, behavior during the pandemic. So it's interesting how institutions are, and that's why I said that perhaps Brazil is in a previous uh, uh, position uh, regarding the other uh, 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 countries of the panelists on this uh, on this panel. Can I jump in for a second? Of because course. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think that this is super interesting just to kind of respond very directly to, to Oscar's points. I think the, the distinction between inclusionary and exclusionary populism is an absolutely critical one, you know, and, and Latin America definitely has a, has a tradition of this. I guess what I would add to that is also inclusionary and exclusionary nationalism. So again, returning to this point about, you know, what can what can be done? What Where do we go from here? Uh, how do we kind of, you know, build something to counter this kind of move towards uh, illiberalism. To me, I think one of the frustrations as a liberal that I feel is that, you know, the idea of liberal nationalism has been entirely eclipsed by this exclusionary idea of nationalism, such that nationalism itself has kind of become a bad word. And I think to me, historically, it has, you know, it has powered anti-colonial movements, it powered movements against communism across Eastern Europe. It led to the establishment of welfare states. And, you know, it's the lifeblood of citizenship. I mean, nationalism is what leads people to fight and sacrifice for their country. It encourages people to pay their taxes, to come out and vote. And so to me, I think the real challenge is, is you know, with the fact that we have these different kinds of populisms and this different kind of nationalism, the challenge is how exactly do we construct that? And I think the post-pandemic world is going to offer, you know, challenges, but also opportunities. And so what would the kind of construction of this more inclusive idea of nationalism, because my concern is that by giving up on nationalism, it's almost like giving up on a container that can be filled with anything. So a political theorist calls it a battery, you know, and so it's a battery that can be used for destructive and constructive purposes. To me, I think the idea of a recovery of a liberal nationalism that can power liberal democracy is, is both, uh, you know, obviously a highly challenging, but also a deeply appealing idea. And, and so, you know, that that's something that I just wanted to mention. The one thing that I will say as regards COVID, um, you know, there's a, a comment in the chat, which I want to acknowledge is that even after COVID uh, broke out in India, protests, particularly farmer protests, have continued. So the initial protests were against the Citizenship Amendment Act, which basically restricted Muslim refugees' ability to apply for citizenship. So to get to your point, Joel, about language, it's the rhetoric. To me, it's interesting that Orban and Modi and Trump all referred to immigrants as, you know, rapists, criminals, vermin. You know, this is the kind of term in Terminology, but it's not just terminology, it's acts, it's, it's concrete walls in India. It's a changing of the constitution to make it more difficult for Muslim refugees to get citizenship. So it's language, 
plus real laws. Um, and I, I'm happy to kind of talk a little bit more about COVID, but to some extent, you know, the the BJP regime's response to COVID in India has been nothing short of criminal in so many different ways. And so, you know, to me, the idea that the world has become so much sicker from COVID because of the ascendancy of these regimes. And to me, coming out of the Indian case and, you know, the continuing to rage second wave um, has been just really tragic and, and you know, if not avoidable, uh, just need not have been the scale of suffering and humanitarian tragedy that um, that a public health emergency was allowed to metastasize into. That's great. Gabor, you want to jump in? Yes, with pleasure. Uh, uh, there is a lot and very <laughs> interesting questions in the chat as well. So let yeah. me let me refer to, to, to the COVID issue and then uh, uh, turning to, to one of the interesting questions regarding the role of the EU, because this is a Hungarian issue right. here in the panel, because Hungary is the only EU country. So uh, I guess that the, the COVID or the treatment of COVID by the uh, Orban government is, is very much characterizes the, the, the entire system and the working of the system. So very few people know, uh, 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 and especially not in Hungary, uh, that the Orban government in the second and the third wave performed uh, very badly uh, on the front of, of COVID. Hungary has still has the highest mortality rate pro one million person. Almost 3,000 people died out of 1 million, which is, which is very high. But in the lack of, of free media, no one is really talking about that. Everyone uh, and the Orban uh, media is talking about the high rate of, of vaccination and not about the, the deaths, which is a consequence of the previous, previous uh, treatment, bad treatment of the, of the pandemic, not to speak about buying uh, uh, mostly Chinese and Russian vaccines. So those uh, 5 million people out of the almost 10 who are vaccinated, in a high number, they are vaccinated with an ineffective or not provenly effective Chinese vaccine or the, the Russian vaccine, which is not approved by the European uh, agency. In other words, uh, the popularity of the Orban government did not go down despite the fact that, that the government performed so badly on the front of, of the pandemic. And the other issue that Orban was the first to use uh, the pandemic to introduce uh, an emergency power, even increasing the unbound executive uh, power, even violating its own constitution. So in other words, I would say that, that here again, my thesis is that this is not so much populism. Uh, the rhetoric is populist, but the very pursuit of this government is to keep its uh, autocratic uh, power. And a couple of words about the European Union. So it's more than 10 years, uh, this Orban government introduced an, an illiberal democracy within the liberal democratic uh, European Union. And actually almost nothing happened. <laughs> a, a procedure have been introduced, but actually due to the, due to the uh, procedural boundaries, uh, no sanctions uh, uh, has been imposed uh, whatsoever. This is partly because of the political willingness, the political uh, kind of protection provided by the European People's Party. Uh, Fidesz uh, belonged for, for very long. They were just kicked out very recently. So they, they protected very much uh, the government and especially the German government. Uh, and this is not, the German government itself only, uh, 
This is the German car industry, which is very much uh, uh, present in, in Hungary and do not want to anyhow uh, harm the Hungarian uh, government's very beneficial treatment of this uh, uh, car industry. Uh, so in other words, the EU, even though has legal toolkits to go after Hungary and even recently uh, empowered EU institutions to go for, for EU funds, curtailing EU funds, but nothing has happened. And I have to assume that this is because of the of the lack of political willingness by, by the EU uh, institutions and the most powerful EU member states. Wow, this is great. There's, there's so much here. Let me, um, let me take um, two more broad themes and then let you can sort out what you want to, to speak to. One of them building on where Gabor just left off very interested, as you know, President Biden is going to, to Europe um, now, um, soon. And I saw he, he published in the Washington Post uh, a column, the title is, my trip to Europe is about America rallying the world's democracies. That was the title of his piece. And I'm sure all of you know, there's been discussion in the Biden administration about um, putting together some kind of summit of democracies and, um, you know, uh, the question of whether that's going to happen. So I'm just curious about this general proposition of, of rallying um, the global community of, of democracies in some way and how you would see the countries that you're studying vis-a-vis um, -vis that proposition. Is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? Would, 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 would Brazil, Hungary and India qualify? Should they qualify? Um, who should be invited uh, to such a thing? I'm just curious as, as, as to your sort of your views um, um, on that. The other um, issue that I had coming into this panel, I want to make sure we just we just get to some some degree of this before we conclude, and that is, I'm interested in the the the, the, the sort of connections, both specific and general, um, between these examples. In other words, I'm, I'm kind of curious whether whether the uh, whether uh, Bolsonaro and Orban and Modi and Trump, do they? Is it your sense that they watch each other and they 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 see each other and they feed off of each other? Um, to what to what extent is this sort of organic, and to what extent do you think there's some there's there's really an ideological project here, and if not linked specifically, is really kind of sort of marching in step. Um, and also what maybe um, the sequence of events too is sort of interesting to me, you know, um, um, you know, this, this didn't happen all at once. And I just was wondering if, if any of you have any comments about what we're seeing. And then finally, I guess I'll just stop here because one last thing is, you know, maybe before we conclude your sense of, of, of where things are going, um, you know, are we at a crisis moment? Um, um, you know, elections are coming up. I don't ask you to predict, but just just your feel as to um, 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 trend and in, in direction, uh, positive uh, and negative. So I apologize in advance. I put a lot out there, but feel free to pick and choose um, uh, what you want to say uh, in, in in response. Maybe I'll start with Perna, and then we'll go around. Thank you, Joel. Um, the one thing that I'll say about this point about, you know, we know from some research that secessionist movements, self-determination movements are contagious. And so the fact that Scotland kind of bringing it to the mm. EU, um, you know, is going to vote on the referenda, that it, that it makes a difference. This learning um, happens, the modeling happens for the Catalan movement. And so I think, you know, given our research on how learning and contagion happen for other political mobilizations, it would seem it would seem ridiculous to not think that there is this kind of nature of learning and emboldening and empowering that happens. And so, you know, you spoke 
spoke about, you know, does India qualify uh, for this summit of democracies? Biden's predecessor, Trump, of course, was ext on extremely friendly terms with Modi. And, you know, Modi's part of the, you know, again, going back to what is the what is the constituent nature of nationalism? Uh, you know, it was interesting for me to hear Oscars laying out what, of what constitute Bolsonaro's nationalism for, for Modi, it's this Hindu nationalism plus this Hindu assertion, which is really in the economic sphere. And so in that way, you know, the fact that he was recognized by Trump, that India was taking its kind of rightful ignored space um, on a global economic stage. I mean, he it's not coincidental that Modi used the stage of the World Economic Forum to, you know, tragically uh, announce the end of COVID just before this deadly uh, second wave hit. And so I think that there is for sure um, this kind of contagion or learning. And I think we need to kind to pay more attention uh, to exactly what are the mechanisms uh, through which this is happening. I think the other thing that I will say, um, partly in response to some of the comments in the chat, is that it is always provocative, and I do so deliberately, uh, to try to make a case for an inclusive liberal idea of nationalism. And so what does this look like? Um, how do we kind of prevent it? And I, I guess the one thing that I will say is that to me, it's important to clarify that as a scholar of identities, I don't think of identities as being exclusive, but as layering on to each other. And so the fact that you are a proud Hungarian national does not preclude your being a proud European or being, you know, a pr having a proud subnational identity. And so Linda Colley, who has this book on Britain, says identities are not like hats. We wear more than one at once. And so I think to me, uh, this idea of cosmopolitanism and globalism uh, are obviously inherently attractive ideas, but I think we ignore the appeal of national solidarities to our peril. And so to me, the idea is how do we kind of, I think Oscar mentioned a great point, which is, you know, I've written a book about regionalism and subnationalism and federalism in India. And I think, again, when we think of where from here, how forward, I think absolutely federalism, subnationalism becomes really important. But to me, uh, subnational identities in India, which are primarily linguistic, because India is a linguistic federation, were very important drivers for social welfare outcomes. You know, we see some of the states that have done much better with COVID being the ones that had existing health infrastructure. And to me, this health infrastructure, the institution of it really goes back to these subnational identities. And so to me, it's not cosmopolitanism or subnationalism or regionalism versus nationalism. It is how do we kind of layer it? And I think, um, you know, for scholars who identify within the liberal left tradition, it's this, it's this unit of analysis, the nation that becomes the most tricky. We're we usually all on board with community and city and subnational identities and you know, cosmopolitanism and globalism is this desiderata. But if anything, the COVID um, crisis has brought home to us is that we live in a world of nation states. Uh, national, you know, this has been national responses, even though it's called for an international response. And so to me, really the way out, the project forward is to first begin to think and then to kind of learn from each other, really returning to this idea of contagion of what an inclusive idea of nationalism looks like. Maybe it's not possible. Maybe we've come just to far down this, um, you know, into this darkness, but I, I have hope. Thank you. Um, Oscar, do you want to go next? Yep. Thank you. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, first, yes, I agree with the, th the, the, the theory just uh, mentioned that there is a contagious populist movement. So obviously that they, they take into consideration other examples, what function. In the case of Brazil, uh, Trump was extremely important in forging the coalition around uh, Bolsonaro. So Bolsonaro is a true full breed exclusionary populist, but he is not an intellectual and he did not organize his campaign. His campaign was uh, uh, organized uh, by other people, including his three sons that are in politics and are more articulated than, than he is. And with uh, the election of Biden, he lost uh, a lot of uh, his uh, support 
uh, from the United States, but also this opens the door for him to try to play the leadership of the right, the extreme right in, in the hemisphere. So yes, it is, uh, it is Biden's election was uh, phenomenal, of a phenomenal importance to Brazil. However, this, uh, uh, the ambitious of the Bolsonaro clan uh, to fulfill this space left by Trump uh, is there. Uh, just to, to, to go back to your last point, which is um, where things are moving. Uh, and obviously, I don't know where things are moving. I hope they are moving the right direction. But I think there is uh, two, uh, two uh, structural questions uh, in the case of, of Brazil. One is inequality. It will obviously be very difficult to have people trusting institutions, uh, uh, understanding democracy, if uh, they uh, feel they were left out of the benefits of these 30 years of liberal democracy in Brazil. So uh, this is a major point that, that jeopardized the rule of law, jeopardized democracy in Brazil. And whoever uh, uh, builds a campaign against Bolsonaro will have to address this in a very consistent way. So this is one, uh, one point. Uh, the second point uh, that I, I envision is the problem of for how long institutions will survive to the constant attacks of the Bolsonaro. As I said, perhaps naively, uh, that until this moment, we didn't fail to the condition of uh, autocratic uh, electoral system is because institutions are very vital uh, and, and fighting very vibrantly at, the, uh, at this moment. Uh, uh, Brazil has a, a, a in Lipshart uh, concept a, a very consensual democracy. So there's a, a, a large number of political parties and the president who wins has to create a coalition and Bolsonaro was unable to establish a strong coalition. So this means that he is not being able to do what Orban did in Hungary by uh, altering the constitution. Brazil didn't make any reform in the constitution, any major law, uh, uh, that uh, uh, threatens democracy until this moment. However, Bolsonaro is using his uh, prerogatives as president, very alike uh, 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 Trump, to uh, in some sense neutralize uh, federal agencies that are responsible to implementation of, uh, of uh, progressive policies of social rights. Uh, he's uh, co-opting uh, the police so in some sense, he's using infralegal and infraconstitutional prerogatives to erode the base of the rule of law and democracy in Brazil. So it's a different uh, uh, model than what we saw uh, in other countries as India, as uh, uh, Hungary, where uh, these populists do have control over parliament. So this is the reason of my very limited uh, optimism. In, in relation to what will happen in 2022. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Thank you for that, Oscar. Um, I want to turn to Gabor. Yes. Yeah. Before I, I, I talk about the, the possible future, let me turn to, to your very first question about yeah. the democracy promotion by President Biden or others. Uh, uh, the possible impact on, on Hungary. I'm very pessimistic about that. As you know, the European Union has been a value community of, of democracy, uh, rule of law, and fundamental rights and had no impact whatsoever on one of the member states. So what can we expect from, from uh, the US uh, and, and President Biden, who is is very, very much uh, 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 a kind of enemy of the Orban, Orban government, uh, Orban from the very beginning uh, of the electoral uh, campaign supported openly uh, uh, Trump. Uh, and I don't think that any kind of democracy uh, promotion would help. 
in, in that respect. Maybe uh, economic pressure uh, would do the thing. Uh, it's still, still important for the, for the Hungarian government. Although, and this is unfortunately the case with, with the European Uni Union uh, uh, connection as well, that uh, Orban build up a very strong connection both to China and Russia. This is a kind of political connection, uh, a strong support and an economic alternative in the case the, the European Union would, would somehow, somehow end uh, uh, supporting an illiberal regime within the, the community. So unfortunately, Orban has alternatives to, to that. And this would be probably the case with the US uh, uh, economic uh, relationship about the future. So uh, as, as Oscar mentioned, unfortunately, this kind of illiberal system is very much entrenched in, in the Hungarian constitution and not only entrenched in the sense of, of uh, laws and, and public uh, uh, legal instruments, but it is entrenched economically as well. So not only are all the, the, the public officials, high-ranking public officials, from the president of the republic to the pact, the members of the pact constitutional court, the president of the Supreme Court and so on, are uh, elected exclusively by Fidesz votes and they are in office for at least nine more years. Uh, the, the regime is, is also entrenched economically. So the government started to privatize uh, actually huge chunk of the Hungarian state economy, including the state run universities. Most of the, of the state universities are in the hands of, of so-called private foundations uh, in the hands of cronies of the government, the Orban uh, uh, party. Uh, and even if a new opposition party would win the next election in 2022, they cannot reverse uh, neither this kind of privatization nor the public setting, public law setting of the system. They need a two third majority to change the constitution. They would need the two third majority to, to uh, elect new, new, a new president of the Republic, new uh, constitutional court justices and so on. And they certainly uh, won't get the two third majority even if they happen to win there is a small hope that, that the opposition parties realized that there is only one, one possibility to win the election against uh, the Orban government is being united. Because as I mentioned, they, uh, the Orban government did not have the, the absolute majority in the, in the last election. That means if they unite, they may get the majority but still they cannot get the two third majority. So this is the, the kind of op optimistic pessimism in, <laughs> in my view. Thank you, Gabor. You're a man after my own heart, optimistic, if not pessimism, skepticism, realism, perhaps, and that might be a good, a good place to end. One thing I did want to, to, I want to thank you all. This has been an incredibly rich, um, nuanced, discussion, a lot of information. Um, we are going to post this so people can um, can, can watch it or, or have access to a video, uh, uh, an audio and a transcript. You can go to our website at carnegiecouncil.org where you'll find other, other resources as well uh, on this issue. To conclude on a substantive point, you know, we may need to reconvene to talk about right where we left off 
um, as Perna was saying, you know, this idea of what, you know, what constitutes the opposition, if you will, but, but something a little more positive to that. What is the, what is the, the sort of positive agenda um, around a liberal national idea? You know, what is the sort of the counter narrative to, to put forward, to, to respond to this moment? And I think one of the interests beyond the obvious at, at this moment right now of concern that people have is there does seem to be a void um, in terms of, well, what's the alternative? What does that look like? It doesn't seem to have formed up yet. So maybe that's an area um, that, that we can pick up. Um, I wanna give you my, my personal thanks for all of this. Um, it's interesting, you know, we, we've been organizing now for a while now by virtual, but this has been an unusual group. I feel like I know you. Um, we had an instant connection uh, I hope that we'll be able to do this in person uh, sometime soon um, back in New York. Um, and one of the things I dislike most about um, virtual gatherings is the, the ending is always very abrupt. The screen just goes blank. So you have my apologies for that. But I look forward to being in touch uh, with you, the panelists, and with many of you uh, in the audience. And uh, thank you so much for the gift of your time this afternoon. I really appreciate it. With the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll be adjourned. Thank you all. Bye bye.